so my lab work on stem cells. So I'll give you a, a sort of very brief general introduction of what, what are the stem cells. So stem cells are foundation for every organ tissues in the body. Uh, you heard a lot of them. Uh, and they can be, uh, they are very plastic. So they can give rise to all different kinds of tissues in, in a given uh, organ. And they also have ability to keep dividing so, so they can make more copies of themselves. So of course you heard stem cells because they are the basis of generating all the organs and tissues. So that's, in the nervous system, uh, there's no exception. So, so basically, uh, here shows a uh, uh, sort of uh, example of how a mouse build their brain. Uh, they start with, if I can get the pointers up, doesn't. So, so you start with a, a very immature tissue. There are stem cells, and they can divide and give rise to neurons. And then neurons can migrate and send their processes and make connections. Eventually, you form this a very complex brain. And in the adult brain, probably most illustrated by uh, Romani Kaha, uh, he's the founding father for modern neuroscience, well, he used this uh, uh, amazing technology to allow him to look at individual neurons. So what you see here is, is uh, the cortex and the hippocampus and the olfactory bulb, are three different structures in the brain where you see individual uh, neurons, very, very complex. And because of the complexity, he postulated that uh, this structure is so stable it's almost impossible to change in large scale. And basically he said there's limited regeneration in this system. And then that turned out to be true for a large part. And what he left at the time is to say, well, maybe uh, uh, everything may die, nothing may be regenerated. Uh, it may be for the science of the future to change that. And indeed, it turned out one of the sort of surprises in the last uh, two decades or so, it's turned out in this stable structure, there are also stem cells that stem cells actually can change the brain structure and contribute learning memory. And when they go wrong, uh, they can contribute brain disorder. So, so this is the topic. Uh, what I'm going to give you, share with you a few data. So this is uh, related to uh, stem cells in the brain, uh, in the adult brain. And study actually uh, traced back to 1960s, where people have been studying rodents uh, to look at them, where they find uh, their dividing cells, uh, showing on the left here, that dividing cells which can be labeled by tracers uh, and they show neuromorphology. So that was the first time suggesting, unlike Romani Gaha said uh, 100 years ago, that there may be some dividing cells in the brain eventually can give rise to new neurons. And that was a radical idea uh, at the time. Uh, it was really well, not well taken by the field. So it took many, many years for people to come back to revisit this issue. And one, probably one piece of evidence made a difference in the field to convince people that not only uh, so there are uh, neural stem cells and new neurons in the brain in rodents, they're also present in humans. So here it shows on the, on the right, and this is one study actually was done in humans. Um, and one of the conditions actually in the lab, in the uh, Fred Gage lab, I figured out that actually in certain surgeries, uh, people actually have been pulsed with tracers to make sure tumor is removed completely. And that serves as an independent approach to label the inviting cells. And later on, uh, when the, the patient passes away, uh, they can actually look at the uh, brain tissues postmodernly. So here shows the example. The red dot here is a cell divided in um, a 71 year old patient. So the, the patient was received surgery, received tracers when he was 71 years old. And one year later, uh, the patient died. Uh, of course, he signed consent form so, so people can look at his brain. And uh, by the time, you can see that not only the cells there uh, last for one year, but also differentiating the neurons. So this actually was one of the first piece of evidence suggesting that not only in the aged population, or uh, relative aged population, that dividing cells in the adult brain, but these cells actually can uh, turn into nerve cells. That really turned uh, the field sort of excited, suggesting this could be a general phenomena, and uh, the brain has a lot more plasticity than we saw. So I want to show you one image and here shows our work in the lab to, to look at uh, newborn neurons in the rodent brain. So here are the white labeling uh, the newborn neurons. And what we can notice, they actually have very elaborate structures. They have this process shooting up. Those are the dendrites where they receive signals from other cells. They send out this long process in the brain, actually in this case, millimeters long in the brain, and to touch their targets so where they send the information and communicate with downstream uh, neurons. So what, what this tells right away is that there are actually many, many new neurons, at least in the rodent brain, but also they have this amazing ability to, to send out their process and make connections in the uh, structure where we believe there's very little regeneration. 
And this is uh, important in multiple ways, I think. Uh, one of them is to tell us the brain is not really that uh, sort of a dead zone for regeneration. It has ability to take upon new cells and make them part of circuitry. And this is important because this can be a sort of trick to, to enhance endogenous generation, but also can be applied for when we have a large loss of neurons, maybe later on we can use stem cell technology, either be transplantation of patient-derived cells or other type of cells to rebuild the circuitry. Uh, but it is the system where endogenous happens that allows to address how this actually brain does it, and then eventually we can learn the basic principle, apply that for a regenerative medicine. So my lab focuses on a region called the hippocampus. Uh, I'm pretty sure you are going to hear this structure a little bit more uh, later during the day. And this structure involves uh, learning and memory. Uh, that's actually most famous for because of one patient, HM, and he has a surgery in the hippocampus that eventually he just can't remember anything onward after surgery. So this is a structure where they are dividing cells in this region and eventually give rise to uh, newborn neurons, as I showed you in the last movie. I want to give you some perspective on how, how robust is neurogenesis in humans. So everybody, uh, everybody in the room sit here, uh, we have about nine, uh, 700 neurons per day. So, so you keep generating new neurons, 700 per day. You saw probably that's not too much for a day, 700 for, for you, we have a huge brain, right? But over a lifetime, that's actually quite significant. So that leads to a large number of neurons, about 1.7% of all neurons in that region actually eventually come from new neurons. Over a lifetime, they generate a lot of neurons. And a lot of studies have been done to look at these new neurons, to look at their functions and dysfunctions. So, so far, uh, people actually find uh, there's quite good evidence in animal models suggesting that uh, these new neurons are not just there, uh, they are integrated in the circuitry, they are very important for learning and memory, especially pattern separation, to, to tell small differences in structure where you come to this room today, uh, you, you, you know actually you come to the right place instead of go to a, a, a different meeting, for example. It turned out this structure also are involved in mood regulation. So, for example, all the clinical used uh, uh, antidepressants, uh, Prozac, uh, you name it, uh, all of them can actually regulate this process. Uh, there are even studies suggest that, uh, at least in rodents, uh, the beneficial effect of antidepressants requires these uh, new neurons to contribute uh, to the brain functions. Furthermore, they are also involved in stress response. Uh, when people get stressed, they could be also uh, involved how these neurons can control the stress uh, hormones uh, and the regulations. In addition, uh, when this process goes wrong, you can to, uh, lead to pretty bad consequences. So for example, in the case of epilepsy, uh, when people have the first episode of epilepsy, uh, at least in rodents, that leads to an uh, increase of newborn neurons. But these newborn neurons uh, do not, probably the environment not correct. They actually hook up wrong. They make wrong connections. And eventually people believe that this is actually the major cause of eventually lead to temporal uh, epilepsy. So it's not always to have more neurons are better, but if they don't uh, link together correctly, they can be uh, uh, the cause of disease. In addition, uh, they have been linked to mental disorders. That's where I'm going to sh uh, share with you a few data to, to see how using models to come up with how do they contribute to mental disorders and how can we use that as a tool to identify targets and eventually find drugs to tr uh, treat them first in animal models and hopefully eventually in humans. And they also have been uh, linked to degenerative disorders, including Parkinson's disease, Huntington's disease, as well as Alzheimer's disease. So well, I want to get into a few data points to share with you. So, so here I want to use that one example. Uh, this is a gene called uh, disruptive schizophrenia 1. Uh, it uh, was initially identified in a large Scottish family. Here shows uh, sort of the pedigree. Uh, what, what's important here is you can see that many of the members in this uh, family has a mutation in this gene. And, and that is actually associated with uh, many uh, psychiatric disorders. It's not specific to schizophrenia, but, but it's linked to major uh, uh, psychiatric disorders, including schizophrenia, bipolar disorders, and major depression and others. So this is a gene, uh, uh, and then eventually, uh, it took 10 years for people to find um, the gene, and now we're 20 years after identify uh, uh, this family uh, cohort. So now uh, I want to see, uh, show you how we can use a stem cell technology uh, to use sort of stem cell as a uh, platform, a tool to understand uh, disease gene functions. So here we have a gene which has been implicated in humans, uh, involving major psychiatric disorders. So I want to know what it does, uh, uh, what kind of cellular process you can regulate. So using uh, the neural stem cell hippocampus, I show you as an example. So we can use genetic approaches to label these cells uh, and look at them and eventually look at what happens. 
So here shows the example. Uh, the red cells actually are normal. The yellow cells, which has defect in disk one, what you can see right away is the cells actually have very different morphology. Uh, the other one is much bigger. Uh, they have, uh, go to the wrong place. They, they migrate wrong, and they have a different uh, uh, connectivities. So using this uh, platform, we can study uh, what, what's the sort of how we lead to that. So I'm not going to show you the detail of the data. And what I want to uh, sort of summarize what we find is that it turned out the risk factor doesn't uh, add alone. You need something from outside to trigger this. It, uh, so, so this is an interaction of extrinsic or the, uh, or the environment together with the intrinsic genetic accessibility. Sus Here we show that it, it turned out there's a neurotransmitter called the GABA, which it provide the initial signal to, to trigger this process. And what this one does is control this process and make sure this process is under control. When you don't have this, everything goes wrong. Uh, you see uh, sort of the wrong cells there. So, so now we know there's a pathway that controls this in animal cells. What that's going to help us? So one thing we can sort of do is actually one thing we did was to go to clinic uh, uh, sort of colleagues to say, well, here we see these intacting pathways. What does that mean for humans, for, for patients? So it turned out, so here shows a collaboration with uh, Daniel Womberg. He's now at the Libra Institute at Hopkins. Is we can look at the interactions of different uh, risk factors or uh, genetic modifications in the gene with uh, the pathway. What we show here is, is one pathway linked to GABA, uh, the other one linked to disc one. Individually, this each of the, uh, uh, so the polymorphism doesn't affect the risk of schizophrenia. But when the patient has both SNPs, uh, their risk for uh, schizophrenia dramatic increase. So here's an example where we can go from animal studies to human genetics to see how uh, this can explain some of the risk factors in human population, which is very heterogeneous. So, so this is uh, one example. And we can go further, actually look at the humans to see how their brain actually functions. So in this case, again, down uh, by uh, Danny Weinberg and colleagues, is looking into the humans with exactly the same SNP. I show you the, the increase of schizophrenia to see how they use their brain in their hippocampus. What we're showing here is that uh, when this patient or this subjects subject to uh, learning tasks or actually uh, memory tasks, they have the response. Then you can use functional MR to look at how their brain responds during this process. What we're showing here is that uh, all three different genotypes or three uh, type of people uh, respond similarly, but the people who actually do double SNP, uh, double polymorphism, where show the increased risk, they actually respond differently. So here we go from. Uh, uh, again, from the human genetics, now we can go to the uh, patient, directly look at their functions, and show this actually, this patient could be different. So we're what here, how can we move further? So here shows a little bit more summary of all the complex pathways we identified. We show you GABA before, we show you this one here. And we can look at further downstream to see how this actually leads to defect in uh, the neural development. And one thing we identify here is one for the particular target called mTOR. And what's important about this target is that it's actually an FDA-approved drug called rapamycin. So this drug has been used in clinic for uh, immune suppression. So it hasn't been used uh, in the brain yet, but it has been using uh, immune suppression in the patient. And what we find is that this is, seems to be a, a target which can regulate this process. So what happened applied the drug to animals? What we find is that this actually can completely rescue uh, the cell morphology I showed you earlier. So they actually can control the cell morphology but it's not relevant uh, for others. So here we turn to a, 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 the last data slide to, to behaviors, uh, where we find is that uh, you actually can make animal models to look at how the response to uh, 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 these genetic manipulations. So in this case, we manipulate the newborn neurons with the disk one. Then we give them two tasks. Uh, one task is called the false stream task. So you drop the animal in the water. Normally, uh, they're going to try to float, keep up the water. If the mice is depressed, uh, they actually just give it up. They just flow. They, they don't really do much. And here, uh, we can quantify that. We quantify so-called immobility, where they, they just flow, they don't do anything. And what you can see here, the red bar here, is if you have defect in this one, it, it turns out they actually are more likely to flow around without doing anything. It's just a, a depressive state. So what's important is that if you treat these mice with uh, uh, rapamycin a few days before that, you can see this is completely rescue this behavior aspect, suggesting uh, one thing is the risk gene can affect adult uh, neural stem cells, affect uh, uh, the development of these neurons, which has a behavior consequence. Secondly, if you understand the biology, understand how we can uh, control this pathway, we can have a beneficial effect. 
So this is one where linked to uh, mood uh, and uh, so the effective uh, response. We also did a second uh, asset, which is called object place re uh, recognition, which is if you put a, a road in, in three different chambers, they actually can tell uh, different subjects. They also like to play new toys. If you give them the same toy, they, they want to play the new toys. So if you put the three ch chambers, they actually can find the new ones. So, so this way, I can look at how they can recognize uh, uh, new things. And this is how to be hippocampus dependent. So this is where requires the function of the hippocampus. What shown here is the same, is, which is if you have a new location, an old location, uh, the mice can always find the new location. If you make a mutation, this score in newborn neurons in adult mouse brain, and now they, they have a problem. They cannot find it. But, uh, so now if you give this mice a drug, rapamycin, now you can see, and now they can find them again. So this is actually rescue again. So here shows another example where a, a, a drug not, uh, can actually can control uh, the, uh, sort of, uh, the hippocampus uh, cognitive functions. So just to summarize, uh, I told you where uh, there are stem cells in the adult brain, uh, at least in the hippocampus. You have, everybody has 700 per day. And that uh, uh, normally contributes to brain normal functions uh, involving uh, learning memory and mood regulation. But if it goes wrong or they have a defect, uh, a gene defect in them, they can lead to uh, sort of bad consequences. And also this is a process heavily regulated by many, many external regulations, including physiological, pathological, and pharmacological stimuli. So I hope I give you one example where, as a basic scientist, we we'll come from a gene and then go to animal model trying to understand how they works, then go read it out. I think that's the hallmark of Hopkins, which we really work together with both basic scientists and clinicians. We can go back together, go back to humans, and go back to animal models and try to find a drug. Thank you. <laughs>